And all of a sudden, I was having so much trouble coming up with Kramer stories. I was like, what if I just give a Jerry story to Kramer? And he would just, you know, take it to a crazy place on his own. You know, like give a really grounded story to Kramer. And that was like a revelation. Uh, what I remember of Michael is that he was very kind to me and very kind of uh, solicitous, you know, uh, concerned about the, the physical stunts that mm. I was doing. Because I do this one Pratt fall where I, where I slip and fall in his drool. And when I did it uh, during the live taping, the audience was like, oh, you know, they thought that I really <laughs> hurt myself. So, you know, um, I think they were a bit relieved with that I didn't. And when Michael, because he's obviously a genius level physical comedian, right, right. when he saw me doing that, he was like, OK, can we get this guy a tailbone pad? Can we get this guy, you know, elbow pads and stuff like that? Cause he came up to me and he said, look, I'm just looking out, looking out for you, man. I wish somebody had been looking out for me when, oh. you know, when I first started doing stuff like this. So I, I, I remember that about him. It was very thoughtful that way. So I'm sitting up in the bleachers and I'm watching this two things, the suits and Kramer, Michael Richards. So I'm sitting up in the bleachers, watching them shoot the scene. All of a sudden that is two sets. One is the office where we auditioned. And then there's the home of Seinfeld. So the two sets together. Okay, so they're doing everything at home with Seinfeld over here. I'm in the bleachers, and this set is empty with the office. All of a sudden, I see the door pop open in the office that's empty. And in walks Kramer with the pipe and with the suit. He's got his costume on already. He's got a pipe. And he's coming in, and he's just coming in the door, going back out coming in the door. He's rehearsing his entrance because he's working on his door. You know, he, he made an art form of coming in that door. So now I'm watching this iconic piece of shtick that everybody loves. Right. I'm watching it being created. He is now creating how to come into an office if he's not in Seinfeld's uh, apartment and he was looking for a job. So that's that's what's in his backstory. It's got to be different, but the same. And I'm watching that for like 20 minutes, man. That's all he did. It's like the guy's nuts. That's what I was thinking. The guy's nuts. He's just OCD. That's what it was, OCD. Just coming in and coming out. Now, I'm sitting there watching him, and that, that's all cool. I'm gathering my information for when I want to work on a shtick. Here's the master right here. And I figure, oh, I see what he's trying to do. Let me help him. So I go down and I and he, he just comes in the door and I go, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And he just like he did like a, a Kramer take. He went, whoa, 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 like that. And I go, oh my God, what, what have I done? And he goes, yeah, what, 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 what? Now he knows me. We've worked together. But he didn't know me, right? At that moment, he didn't want to talk to me. He, he was locked. You know, just what, what, what's going on? And I go, um, well, you know, you're coming in with the pipe and the thing and you're trying to get the doorknob and you're putting it in it. So if you put the pipe in this hand and open the doorknob and then so you can come in. Yeah, so I worked it out for him. I said, because uh, I've been watching you. Because you're watching me? I go, yeah, yeah, but he says, thank you. Okay. And he's very standoffish, like I'm going to hit him or something. He said, thank you. And I go, wow, I mean, I know this guy. What? Okay. I thought, okay, I'm sorry. And I figured, well, I just disturbed him. So I turn, I go back up in the bleachers and he left. He wouldn't rehearse anymore. And then when he, when it was time for him to shoot, he did it completely different. He probably went into his dressing room and rehearsed a whole different thing because I was watching him. I mean, that's a man that, I mean, everybody's, you know, way of getting to where they want to be. is just weird. Okay. Um, uh, Michael Richards was an absolute I mean, you have to go back to Buster, you know, Buster Keaton or, or, or Charlie Chaplin or Dick Van Dyke, even more contemporarily, or Danny Kay. People that were physical comedians like he was. He would rehearse the Kramer skid stops in Jerry's apartment like he was Barishnikov. And our two, my, the Peterman office and the, um, the Seinfeld apartment were right next to each other. So I had his door right there, right, and I could see it right from my desk through the 
uh, the other door through the other uh, door of the uh, of the office. Nice. Privately in the dark, rehearsing that skit stuff, rehearsing that skit stuff. Every time he did a show, it had a different cadence to it. And I mean, he was an absolute genius for that. And and his character, just, I mean, his character choices were just beyond. It's so much fun working with. Speaking of improv, there's a scene at the end of the show, that episode, where Kramer is apologizing to the monkey. <laughs> they shot the whole scene, or they shot the whole episode, didn't shoot that scene, cleared the audience out. Then they brought in the chimp, they put the chimp in the cage, they turned on four cameras, and they just said, go. And Michael Richards walked in there and did 25 minutes of goofing around with the monkey. That was some of the funniest stuff I've oh, ever wow. seen in my life. And in the episode, it's 15 seconds, right? but it just kept going and going and going. And it was, it was, it was hilarious. That, that, that was some brilliant improvising. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing about Seinfeld. So everybody had their own style, right? Of comedy, you know, um, yeah. Michael Richards is like a machine. I don't know if you guys know, but he would like, he would do, he would rehearse his crazy entrances like over and over and over and over. Like he, you know, was, was like a dancer really like just doing it over and over and over so that it was when it, when it came time, like cameras are rolling, he knows exactly, you know, he doesn't have to stop or wait. I mean, he was just a physical comedian, like, like, really, really um, machine-like in his precision is what I'm saying. You know, part of that show that week was when I look back, because I, I did a lot of guest star roles. And and oftentimes the the cast, if you're a regular on a show, you're like, you're, you're sleepwalking through it. The cast on Seinfeld, they were all really professional. Like, they worked really hard. And, and nobody worked harder than Michael Richards. Like, he would grab me. And say like, yeah, hey Tim, uh, you want to work on this? And and we'd go off to the side, and it, that's very odd for for half hour TV when when actors who are regulars on shows want to actually work. They're usually much more concerned with uh, the new car they're leasing, or you know what right, I'm saying, or, right, or, right, or yes, booking that yes. flight to Cabo. Like you know, th th that's the kind of stuff you normally get. But on Seinfeld, they were all really professional, especially Michael Richards. Um, Michael Kramer was was kind of the odd man out in a lot of ways. And I you may have heard this from other guest stars, but he was always I, I, I heard that he was always kind of like the Marx Brothers in that the Marx Brothers, whenever they did something twice, it was never as good as the second time. So Michael Kramer would be constantly off on his own doing his own practicing for some new way of coming in because if he did it twice it would it wouldn't feel as fresh for him so he was he was a bit of a loner in that sense that he um he uh he, he was always off doing his own thing in the way that he wanted to do it and uh so anyway it um uh, the ad lib on on seinfeld to draw it back to that was summer nights and, and <laughs> i was afraid of since it was an ad lib of uh, uh kramer went that's very funny if you watch him in the scene right. he he wasn't expecting it right and he just said that's very funny and i thought oh shit they're gonna cut the scene it was going great and it's gonna be my fault and uh and then uh for some reason i really got along with everybody there they were so giving and nice and warm and particularly um uh you know um Going blank now, Michael Richards. Yeah. Well, apparently, they said he doesn't necessarily do this, but we really buddied up, and he wanted to rehearse, and I love to rehearse, and he wanted to rehearse and rehearse, and he'd go, "Listen, I want to." I said, "Hey, man, your show, you're the man. Let's just do whatever you want to do." <laughs> right. And what's great about it was the last moment was, in many ways, and this is like sacrilegious. Can I do the, the Jewish star and the cross at the same time? <laughs> um, uh, it was a bit improv and then it was put together and then carved. But I get the feeling that's what they do a lot. You know, I'm not there weekly. They improvise, and then they carve it and put it back in. Oh, Me doing Italian and him winging it with the thing. pennies. And then yeah, yeah. my favorite, too, when he kicks his feet up on the counter yeah. and I'm going crazy and stuff. Michael Richards, like stutter step, uh, 
entries, you know, entrances in, into all the scenes, you know, right. which I, I sort of thought, okay, that's like a, that's like a physical thing he's got. I, while we were rehearsing, I'd see out of the corner of my eye, like this frantic movement on the, the, the corner of the soundstage. And I, and I'd look over and Michael would be like in a, in a corner of a soundstage, like, so, and, and like practicing this, the, the entrance, like getting the moves down. Wow. Like, like, Cause to me, they were interchangeable. You know, right. those, they, that was like a Kramer entrance. Not the case to him. To him, every one of those clearly was separately crafted. And it was, I, and I was this like, is six seasons in, he's still practicing six, that. Yeah, six seasons, yeah. absolutely. Uh, I, I, anyone else would have just been like, yeah, I, I, I'll do one of those, you know. But no, it was it was important to him, and he. Uh, I, I, frankly, I was really impressed by that. Yeah, I remember the very first rehearsal we had, where he hit the door jam on his way in, with that kind of spastic move, and the whole set shook, and half the people on stage had fallen down. They were laughing so hard. I mean, it was like a three minute laugh, and. And, you know, Michael just fed off that, and that character started getting big. I really am pissed off that Michael Richards got such bad play out of that thing that happened years after. I'll even start to get emotional about this, because I, the guy really works his ass off. And I don't think I saw anybody work harder on that show. I mean, and I say that with emotion, because I really think that he got a bad deal there in terms of... so. That day when I worked with him, he was actually quite, um, you know, he was really a sweet guy, but he's really onto himself, you know, and he's like working on his stuff and boom, boom, boom. You know, this guy works hard and he's fucking funny, right? So we're about to shoot the scene and I think we rehearsed or sort of there were lines were there, but um, <laughs> Larry David comes up to me just before the scene we're about to shoot and we have a studio audience there. And everybody's there, and Michael's in, in tune, and and uh, I'm all ready to go. And he says, "Listen, John, whatever you do, you cannot laugh. Okay, you cannot <laughs> you cannot blow a take here for us because we do not know what Michael's going to do. The camera doesn't know, the editors don't know, nobody knows. But we're prepared for him to do whatever he's going to might do. And if it's great, and if it's funny, and if it blows the roof off, you cannot laugh." All right? You just cannot laugh, right? And he was really pretty intense about this because Larry's not a, a funny ha-ha guy, right? He's sort of a funny, you know, and when he's serious, you know, he's like, so I'm going, okay, and I'm getting it because he's really being serious because if I fuck up a take, you know, then, you know, there there, there goes TV history, right? Um, and I take my work seriously, and I also took how Michael was just dodging in and out of the humor so so the whole bit so basically what i had to do we do a take and he does some stuff now i can't honestly remember guys i can't remember the number of takes we did because i just sort of immersed myself in the process but i do remember after one or two takes and the audience was going ape shit, and the cameramen were laughing right cameramen have to hold themselves and sort of like <laughs> and sort of take their hands off the camera so that it doesn't shake. And the audience was all to my left, and Michael was to my right, my stage right, so as I recall. So what I did was I bit my upstage cheek. And you can kind of see during the thing, when he starts talking, my, my, my uh, jaw clenches a little bit because I'm biting into my cheek so I don't laugh. Mm. And when he did the thing where, you know, you know, sometimes I like to get high all the time. And he has the beer with the cigarette and then he drinks it. That was totally not in anywhere, anywhere, right? And he does it. And all I want to do, and the audience is going ape shit crazy. And the cameraman, everybody is. And I'm, I'm aware of that, but I'm here in the scene. But I just want to laugh, right? right. Because normally I'm the... At Second City, I was kind of the funny guy, not the straight guy. So to, to be there in that situation was great and, you know, enlightening. But fuck, he was funny. And then he drinks the beer. And then they open the bar, boom, and it hits his head. And all that shit happens. And that was electric, right? 
And at that moment, I really thought I was going to pee myself. I just really didn't, you know, and, and I hung on uh, like a, a good rodeo rider and made it through. And uh, I'm glad I did. Um, the other big thing I think that was for me, I, I had a problem with the line with the word midget, right? So in the first episode, George uses that word. And in the script, uh, Mickey doesn't respond to it. He treats it like it's okay. And I let Jerry and Larry know, in no uncertain terms, it's not cool. It's not a good word. And I was like, how are we going to work around this? Because it's like, there's never been a very special episode of Seinfeld where you're <laughs> explaining something. You had to build it into the character. And so, you know, uh, Larry said, um, and I remember this distinctly, he said, give me a, a fast reaction followed by a slow burn. So that's why you see that. <laughs> Like that beat, and then the the slow, slowly I turn, going over to George, and I go, it's, "It's little people, you got that." And that that beat for me, like that, just sells Mickey. Like this is who he's going to be. He's ready to trounce. He's ready to put your head to a wall if need be. So don't say the wrong thing. And I felt like, and then Michael improvises the word, the line, "Easy, Mickey, easy," and oh, I was like, that. That catapulted like who this guy's gonna be from now on. So those lines were never there, right? So when he goes easy, Mickey, easy, I was like, oh, that's who this guy is now. He's ready yeah. to fight. Drop the hat. And he made it a point with me in my first episode and the episodes that had followed. He said, you know, the way it works is you you rehearse for four days, you shoot on the fifth day for the show like this, and you know. This was my first sitcom, but I had watched other, you know, having been on sitcom sets, I would watched the way this works. And people come in, they do their scene to rehearse, and then they go back to their room or they go hang out, whatever. But Michael was always like, let's work on this. Let's work on this. Let's work on this. So we were always together working on stuff, even when it wasn't time for us to be on set. And that that's something I never experienced with any other actor. And that I owe that to Michael and his, like, his dedication to all the physicality, everything. because. You know, we had a lot of trouble sort of working out the fight, right? right. Like, I didn't want to, I didn't want the little, the little man to come off like an animal in that sense. I wanted him, I wanted him to play off as equals. And so we started off doing stuff where I'm like on his back and he's spinning around and we we're like knocking over flats. And I'm like, yeah, this isn't going to work. It doesn't feel right. And also, there's a danger element that might right, come right. into play here. He's a big guy. I'm not a big guy. So, you know, is it? I, I was like, is there a way we can just sort of go at it, but you know, as if we have equal strength, equal power? And so that's when you see that first beat where Michael grabs Mickey or Kramer grabs Mickey, and he's got me, and I've got him, and we're you know, rocking back and forth and shaking one another. Literally, it's me just holding on to Michael and him <laughs> throwing me this way and that, and throwing yeah. himself this way and that. Um, but that mano y mano thing, I think, was really integral to the development of their friendship because it was like they're equals in that sense, right? They're just two guys that every now and then they, they throw the punches, right? So uh, that was just so much more funnier to me, that classic sort of Mutt and Jeff appeal of these two guys who are on equal footing all the way across. Right? But Michael, w once Mike, uh, Michael Richards gets into Kramer, he's Kramer. He's Kramer. You're not going to mess. You're, if you're talking to anybody at that point, you're talking to Kramer. Because he would really work on it, you know. And so I'd, I had to go to Julia and I said, see that light up there? Get in it. Because she was so much shorter than than, than Michael. And I said, and she said, okay, thanks. <laughs> she, you know, and she did it. She, she'd move herself over and get into her life. Because Michael would just go nuts. You know, if it was one of those scenes where he would go nuts, I said, you just got to stay in your light, Julie. And she would do it. it was kind of yeah, I mean, Michael is, you know, an incredible talent. And uh, you, you never know what he's going to do. And, and, and every take is different. Um, so, you know, you you just sort of stand back and you and, and you let Michael do do what he does. My response to it was uh, these guys are really good actors. Meaning they're just, you know, very funny and very loose. And uh, Michael Richards, I remember, was very, very disciplined on the set. He, you know, he has all these crazy uh, pratfalls that he does. And the way he does that, which they look very spontaneous, is, is he rehearses right. a lot. So, you know, you'd be sitting here talking to 
George and Sherry, and they'd be working on the script. And over in over in the darkened part of the of the set in in the Kramer set, Kramer would be coming through the door seventy times trying to figure out the exact right way to fall down. So uh, my my interpretation of it was, and I've done several sitcoms before, uh, not to cast any aspersions, but right. I mean these guys are really good actors and very very funny, and they they worked in a real uh, a creative process. There was no doubt. And Kramer was like, Hey, I brought in um, some African music for you and I to practice in my trailer. And I was like, Oh, for God's sake. So, you know, of course, like you can't go against the cast. And, and he was a great guy. Was so nice. And so I was like, okay, I'm pretending I'm like method, which I'm not. <laughs> and I had to go in his trailer and we had to practice dancing to African music. And I was like, this is so odd, but that's the way they worked. They were really, they, re they perfected everything. So I fell in love with Michael the moment that he was working out the convulsions behind the sofa to Mary Hart's voice on Entertainment Tonight. I think he's the greatest physical comedian of, of the generation. And he idolized Red Skelton, Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy, Jacques Cotty, um, Keystone Cops. And he worked it out like, piece by piece. I mean, it was like a choreographed dance. And he has special shoes that he always wore that are safer and have really le uh, rubber soles. And I just sat there completely mesmerized and I fell in love with him. I just was like, oh my God. And um, I mean, we started hanging out immediate. I mean, it was like mutual. I mean, we just... After after a rehearsal one, uh, no, at lunch break, he asked me to go to lunch with him. Nice. And uh, I was like, oh, sure, okay. And we just started talking and um, and then, you know, that's how it started, just like lunch. And then by the end of the taping, um, we he was going to ask, you know, ask me out on a date. And, and um, it was just great. And actually, I was at the because I was his girlfriend, I was at the taping of almost all of the, the rest of season three, all of season four. I was always at the tapings. On set, he was still Michael. But when he was Kramer, he was that crazy. He And, and in real life, Michael was not Kramer. But he was the consummate professional. And then he and I would hang out and he would study old movies with video, right? He would study a um, Buster Keaton movie, but watch it backwards, uh, like, you know, clip by clip and and with me and show me how uh, a physical comedian sets up a pratfall like and, and, you know, he would watch it backward and he would, you know, narrate. OK, and then he does this and he does it and then he would sh do it forward and and. Um, so he studied, he studied. And when he was, I mean, I know these inside things. When he was a little boy, um, he idolized Red Skelton and he would get his mother on Saturdays to drive him to Beverly Hills to Red Skelton's house. And he would just sit across the street um, in, you know, like on the corner and just stare at Red Skelton's house. And, and he would say to himself, someday I'm going to be like him and I'm going to have a house and I'm going to. But, you know, isn't that amazing? Oh, and another thing was, you know, how Kramer's hair just kind of got bigger and bigger. Yes. Well, that actually evolved because when you see the pilot, for instance, Michael's hair is practically greased down. He's, right, he's yeah. Italian, 100% Italian with this Romanesque kind of curly. And um, he would have this habit of just kind of like going like this right before a take because he was, you know, just nerves or whatever. And his hair just started kind of going up and up and up and up. And people noticed it. He didn't really know that it was happening. And then the next thing you know, they aden identified it with Kramer and then... Psh, you know, <laughs> he just, just picked up on it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and and like the entrance, um, I think once he thought he was late for a cue and he just kind of like went in and that's, and it was, and it was so funny and it got a laugh that 
that kind of started him on, well, I should make every entrance different somehow. It's, it's part of, you know, so that's right. how that evolved. It's like, he started getting scared every once in a while. And that was when he, like, people would just come up to him. And he wasn't used to that, you know, like, right. and he thought, wow, I hope no crazy person just comes up to me or something. I, I can remember we were in San Francisco once and this kind of scary looking guy just came up right up to him. And for a second, he was, he was a little frightened. Um, but yeah, the, I was there when like all of a sudden they were on the cover of people and, and all the, you know, it, yeah, it just really kind of, um, yeah, and they and all it, I thought, handled it beautifully too. No, no, nobody got a big head and he was just always grateful to have a job and to be being paid to do what he loved to do. Cause he was a real working actor for 20 years who right. he did a pilot once a year and that would, last him the year you know um and um he i mean he had to have odd jobs and stuff to make ends meet like he was a bus driver school bus driver and um his wife worked at sears and and so fridays was good but it didn't last all that long but it 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 um he was just always grateful and humble he believed that you should never be injured doing a pratfall ever. And so he would have padding on the corners of furniture and all kinds of things. Um, he was We're very safe and conscious. And um, Michael and I used to talk about, Michael started out in stand up. And, um, you know, he came up with all those guys like Leno, Robin Williams. Uh, yeah. Kennison. Um, and he got out of stand up because it was very angry. Uh, like, and there was a lot of, you know, drugs and drinking. And it was, it was a very dangerous world. And he had to pull away from it because he didn't drink, he didn't do drugs. And he found himself being too angry all the time. And, but I do think that comedy also has roots in anger and pain yeah. because laughing really gut laughing belly laughing can almost be angry in a weird way um i don't know if 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 i'm making sense no you totally and, are you know and 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 even michael and i would talk about how stand up comedians all the terms they use are like oh he killed yeah, I slayed them, you know, like, you know, it's just all like, and when Michael and I were together, he went back to it for a little while. He'd do the improv and Bud, um, you know, encouraged him and he was doing really well, but then he just got too busy and he used to have a shoe box that was called the joke box and he kept it under his bed and he would think of a, a, a something funny and write it down and just throw it in the shoe box. And then we'd, we'd get it out and just pull stuff out and he'd riff on it. But uh, of course, you know, we all, we all know what happened with Michael at um, later, and I think that 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 is also tied in with anger, because Michael doesn't have a, a racist bone in his body, but he was being heckled and he lost his temper, and he handled it in a way that I know he regrets and didn't mean he thought he was being funny cutting edge pushing the envelope and it just all went to hell but the whole anger aspect of that i think terrified michael well he just had so much soul homework as i call it after that because it it was a horrible thing jerry stood by him um and Michael really had to face his anger uh, through that, you know, and the woman he's married to now, I think really stood by him through all that. But um, stand up is a slippery slope, man. 
I brought I brought Woody out to LA um, for trips, and we'd go over to Michael's house. We we spent Thanksgiving and Christmas um, at with with Michael and his mom and daughter and Woody and me, and Woody uh, Woody really liked Michael, and Michael was fascinated by Woody. He hadn't really been around a person like Woody. And a few years later, when I had to move my brother to a um, group home for a while in Alabama through United Cerebral Palsy, Michael just donated $20,000 to United Cerebral Palsy in Woody's name. Um, Woody kind of inspired Michael to be more sensitive about people with special needs and grateful again for having your health and your body. His mother, uh, his Michael's mother was just, she was so sweet. Oh God. And she loved Woody. His mother was an amazing woman. She raised him by herself. Michael used to say he was one of the original latchkey kids, you know, cause mm. she worked three jobs and, she would leave money on the table for him. And yeah, so and everybody there, thought right? he was Jewish. Everybody, well, everybody, you know, pretty much just assumed he was Jewish, but he was Italian and um, did a lot of yoga. That's how, that's another way he kept himself very flexible, Limber, yeah, flexible for the comedy was yoga. Yeah. Oh, and one of the things Michael did for Woody was, um, the very the final episode, right? The very, very, very last one. Yeah. He went around and got everybody to sign it and sent it uh, to United Cerebral Palsy, and they auctioned it off in a, a private auction, and they made like um, an unbelievable. <laughs> Michael, off of it. One of the perks of my job was I got to create music that Michael Richards would move to. You know, that's right. always a treat to see his physical comedy to my music, whether he's doing a butt wiggle dance to my f fake entertainment tonight music before he spazzes out or something like the uh, African love dance in a towel. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that was really a perk. Or what I most remember of the of the week was uh, Michael Richards. Um, the scene where he pours the cement into the washing machine that took about four hours to film. And a lot of the cast and crew and a couple of the casts from the studios on either side just came in to watch him because it was four hours of, of absolute comic gold, uh, everything he did. And we had to be careful because we were laughing so loud. They kept telling us to shut up. You know, we had a scene where Newman and Kramer are in a courtroom, it, it was as good as anything I've ever, any slapstick I've ever seen. I mean, it's like a great pie fight uh, in, in the silent days and uh, they, they couldn't use it. At the end of the day, it was just too long and it, and it wasn't that important. But just to watch these two incredibly gifted physical actors do that, I mean, it was, it was like going to school, it was great. Um, and then everybody kind of broke off and did their thing. And Michael Richards came up to me and he was like, you know, let's go. Do you mind rehearsing? I was like, no, I love that. I love to rehearse because I've been on so many shows where people are like, no, no, we just do it live or whatever. And I was like, oh, oh my God. So I love that he loved to rehearse. And he was, so I originally, I said, I said to him, um, uh, oh, when's your birthday? Because I ask everyone their birthday because I need to know their sign, like where they're coming from and everything. So he said, well, what do you think I am? And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know you. I would have to ask you a million questions. And he said, well, we have a lot of time. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I think I asked him over a million questions. I know everything about the guy, everything. And he was so open and he was so just, raw and and answered everything and just we got along really well and um and he loved to rehearse so we must have done it a hundred million times too and he'd work out all his things and and he and he took me to lunch and 
he just couldn't have been nicer. So we had two actors, Michael Richards, and another wonderful actor named Steve Vinovich um, audition. And Steve was really the actor as written. Um, you know, in the pilot, Kramer was this, you know, agoraphobic kind of shut-in who shuffled in and out of um, uh, Jerry's apartment in his bathrobe. And Steve played that to a T. Michael Richards literally like exploded into the room during the audition. And, um, and it, Warren Littlefield said, we can't not go with Michael Richards. How can you pass that up? You need to reimagine the character and sort of embrace what Michael brings you. And, and, uh, and they did. So I started kind of like freaking out a little bit. And Richards goes, hey, come on, we're going to lunch. And Richards takes me to lunch and he sits there and he, he, and he talked about himself. And it was really, really interesting because he, how who he thought he was. And you got to see, this guy is an artist in a weird way. And in the same way that, you know, I mean, I've gone to school with some pretty, you know, heavy, heavy artists and stuff and everything. This guy is that, he's a performance artist. I mean, I grew up with Bill Hicks. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I mean, these guys are one in a million. And, and, and watching him work and how serious he was about how comedy was constructed. And he sat there and he goes, you think this show's funny? And I went, yeah. And he goes, do you think it works? And I go, I'm the new guy. Yeah. I think it does. And I'm, you know, he goes, I, I'm a, uh, he goes, he goes, but you do physical comedy. And I go, yeah, yeah, I can do physical comedy. He goes, so let's talk about that last scene. And I go, and I looked at him and I go, do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And I said, you have full permission to throw me around like a, like a rag doll. And I said, do whatever you need to do. I will never, I mean, just like, you know, I said, make something crazy happen. And he goes, good. And, uh, and we were off to the races and, I mean, and it's, and so he was like a dance partner on that thing. Cause we really, and we, we worked it out. They wouldn't rehearse it very much. Cause we, he and I, you know, you know, and he, and if you look right over my head, it breaks the wall. He throws me so hard up against that wall. And I'm six foot two. I'm not a little guy and he's giant. And he just threw me like a rag doll up against that wall. And you can see the wall break right next to my head. Uh, it, it was, it was pretty spectacular. It was, it was a great, it, he was a great dance partner, but, uh, I tell you the most interesting thing on that same lunch with, with, uh, Richards was, and, um, and I hope he doesn't mind me telling the story, but I think he's fascinating. And, uh, and the, and I'm not, and because I, because I did grow up with Bill Hicks, I did, I did, was not surprised that the thing that happened did happen mm. because the, you know, and, uh, the TMZ sort of like did and, and, right. and covered and because he told me this, he said, he goes, you know, I never thought I was going to work again. He said, I went into a casting director's office and, um, and, and I, I sat down and I went, you know, looked at him like this and they said, I, I can't, I'm not going to take you because I've got somebody like you. And he said, do you have anybody like this? And he said, and I took my hand and I cleared their desk and I put it on the floor. And he goes, do you have anybody like that? <laughs> <laughs> Spontaneous. <laughs> and so, and everything. And so, you know, and he, you know, he, you gotta he have that edge. Yeah. He had this reputation of being kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a wild, you know, Canon, and he also said he used to like when he was doing stand up. He liked he liked to stir things up. He, he was he's kind of a dotist, you know the kind of the guys that would be, the art movement that where they would kind of shoot guns in theaters or you know scream fire in theaters just see you know make pandemonium happen. And he said that he used to like to get into fights uh, at at, um, at comedy you know at, at comedy clubs because he needed something real to happen. He said mm -hmm. I wasn't happy unless something real was happening. So the thing that happened, you know, it just it. It it wasn't out of character. I don't I don't think for a second that guy was racist. He's not. He was trying to create. He was shooting a gun off in a theater. Right. Um, he was do, he was being a dotist, and um, but he's not. And uh, you know, uh, he's he's an amazing. Uh, he did things like you know that when they when they bring that that box of the box of clothes in. Yes. It, 
he looked at it and he started, he, he looked at it. And it was like, you could see this machine going comedy, comedy, comedy. He opened it up. He started like that. And he started smelling the clothes because you knew this clothes stunk. You know, it's just like, like an old grandpa clothes and everything's like going like that. And then, you know, and just like, you know, he was, he was trying to figure things out. Like, what's funny about this? What, look, what am I going to do with this hat? What am I going to, you know, like that, you know, he was, he was just trying to figure things out. Uh, brilliant. Work I mean, so hard. Incredible. Incredible. And you know, he rode his bike and <laughs> he rode his bike to work. You're kidding. No, you could see him all over studio city riding his bike. It was, I'd sit there and I'd go like, there's, <laughs> there's Richard <laughs> just drove by me on his bike. And you, you, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it was him. He always, he rode his bike everywhere. And so he'd, he'd ride his bike to rehearsal, uh, you know, um, and yeah, people just didn't, of course they didn't know. It was crazy. But, but you know. uh, um, Michael was just so, it was like, he was so, I don't know, you know, I've worked enough to know that there are people who just are over there and they do their work with you. And then there are people who just make you feel like you belong. It's a very hard thing to belong in a show in their fifth season, you know, and you walk on the set and it's like a big part. I think it was kind of a big part. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, you know, he was so kind to me. He talked to me about like yoga and and he was funny and i think we were laughing at some point because i sh i showed him my signature move which wasn't even a yoga move i i had this party trick where i used to put my my feet behind my head <laughs> and i showed it to him and he was like oh my god oh my god you have to come over here and show everybody and <laughs> and i think i can't remember if i actually did it or whether he just wanted me to and then something got in the way but he was so impressed that I could put my feet behind my head. Oh God, just don't even, it was terrible. Look, I'm having a hot flash just thinking about it. <laughs> but he was laughing and he was so kind and conversant. I really liked him.